Okay, so, um, um, so I, I'm a, not an archaeologist, I'm a historian by training. Um, I want to talk a bit about my uh, research I've been doing into Holocaust now and how it connects to some of the things that we've been talking about in this session um, and then propose some kind of discussion points um, for moving forward. Um, but the reason I chose to focus on this case study is because it is an area that does actually intersect with, uh, intersect with archaeology because the lecture I'm about to talk about was a uh, far-right um, study of the, the concentration camps in um, Germany, uh, sorry, in, in, in uh, Poland. And what I'm going to just do is quickly give a background to this. I'm not going to try and give you too much of the history because I want to get to the point about talking about what we can do about this. Um, but just to kind of say, because one of the things we've been focused on is kind of what's happening now. And I think one of the things we have kind of also been thinking about is that the far right um, are, 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 not, are not come from nowhere. And they have been preparing and working and laying the ground throughout the sort of 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and up to present day. So we kind of also have to remember that their own time, they've, they've also been developing mechanisms and that's also something we need to engage with which I think um, is sort of seen as kind of this populism has just sort of happened and actually there's quite a deep history to it and what they've developed from that. Um, so just kind of a background to this, so um, in my research the first record I found of Holocaust and that was actually in Britain in 1942 as the genocide was taking place and it was in these publications by a man called Alexander Ratcliffe. Um, but basically what's quite interesting about these initial reports, they kind of come out in newspapers and periodicals, uh, far-right publications at the time. The same messages that were out in those at that time, 42, it's pretty much the same message Holocaust and I have today, so it hasn't actually changed much. Their initial response was quite, um, uh, it's pretty much remained the same today. Um, the so, sort of one strange thing about uh, the far-right Holocaust and in this instance was they were actually very much focused on the kind of Jewish element of the side, whereas Allied governments at the time wanted to focus on a kind of universal narrative of suffering. So they didn't specifically always focus on what happened in the Jews of Europe and their destruction. Um, so it's very much focused on a kind of anti-Semitism, focusing on a uh, Jewish perspective. Um, but obviously the main aim of Holocaust now is to rehabilitate these kind of far-right fascist neo-Nazi ideologies by saying that this genocide didn't take place, um, and because it didn't take place, we can actually we should revisit that ideology and think of it a new um, without this kind of genocidal attachment to it. Um, so um, the whole kind of central obviously you may gather that is it's about a Jewish conspiracy, the idea that um, the world is run um, uh, by, uh, by Jews, um, and the idea is to kind of of the conspiracy is to, is to discredit any kind of sense of nationalism, neo-Nazism, or fascism, or belonging within that narrative. Um, and the main function of it um, works to say that the supreme aim of the conspiracy is to create and bring about the white genocide, basically, that, um, that the uh, narratives are about by these particular uh, groups um, uh, and through immigration is to destroy a white racial purity, which we've kind of looked at and talked about throughout this. Um, and so this is the kind of um, Kind of focus on this, so that the idea that kind of Jew the Jewish population will remain and be the only kind of pure race that's left on the planet, while all the other kind of races have uh, kind of been uh, diluted into what they call one world, as in all that everybody will be kind of the same, there will be no white race left. So, taking the narrative of actual genocide to kind of invert it and use it to sort of say that the white, white, whiteness is under threat. Um, I don't want to kind of go into all of the things that they say because I haven't got time, but this just kind of gives you an idea. But the, the main kind of um, I would say so the, is this kind of main slogan here, no holes, no holocaust, which is focusing on um, the excavation that these um, deniers were doing at the concentration, uh, sorry, at the death camps of Auschwitz in my diary. Um, what it came out was in this report, which was called the lecture report, um, and it's, you, can, you can see, and I'll talk about this in a second, but it's actually got kind of an academic look to it, it's supposed to be like a journal, an academic journal, so they've been producing these journals, but it's actually in the fact that the material in it contains also just the kind of titles of it. So actually it's the end of the line. So they're kind of using actually the kind of um, mechanisms of death and kind of taking taking mick out of it in order to kind of discredit it. So it's even within what they're trying to do, um, it's all about kind of causing maximum as much pain and hurt as possible while doing this kind of denial. Um, the background to report is commissioned 
to support a man called Ernst Zimmer, who was on trial for distributing Holocaust denial material in Canada. Um, so they did this report. Um, Lecter was brought in to do this. He had no academic qualifications, but they pretended he did. They said he was kind of a... a, 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 a um, but, uh, uh, they said that it was uh, an expert witness, that he had qualifications in chemistry, and he actually had um, a BA in history, but he didn't actually have any of the kind of major qualifications that required. Um, and his evidence was actually thrown out of um, court, and it was revealed that actually he had no you know, academic credentials whatsoever, but they pretended he had. If you're interested, there is a film about this in popular culture. It's all missing it's all about this, so if you are interested and want to know more about it, do look up that film, do watch it. It's not very it's grim watching, but you know, nevertheless, um, it's something to do. But I think what's important for us is thinking about the psychology of denial and how this relates to what we've been talking about in the session. So one of the kind of main things is that um, the attempts of denial um, in these far right narratives is to kind of create a sense of intellectual superiority that only they know the truth. Everybody else is being duped or stupid, and their mission is to reveal this truth, right? Um, and the narratives um, are actually kind of very simple, um, but what's interesting is that they rest primarily and always on a popular narrative or understanding of the Holocaust. So they don't actually engage with historiography, they don't engage with academia. And what they look at is things that people in the public will know, so things like Schindler's List um, and the kind of key sites, particularly Auschwitz, as this. David Irving, a great British Holocaust now, people might have heard of, one of his things, um, key messages was he said we need to sink the battleship Auschwitz because once the public who dismiss that, um, then the whole kind of Holocaust history will come unraveled from their point of view. But of course, the Holocaust is not just Auschwitz, it's a complex interweb of things that are going on. <coughs> In different regions, different parts across Europe and time. So, but in the public imagination, if you think about how the Holocaust is taught, you know, it very much starts out about kind of separation of people, then it's about moving to ghettos, then it's about to camps, and then it's you know, ultimately to, the, to Auschwitz. Actually, you know, the history is far more complicated than that that's taking place, but that's the, you know, the image in the public imagination, and that's what denies the attack. They're not interested in talking about what happened in Russia, not interested in talking about kind of camps that people have never heard of. Um, because they, they don't see any kind of value in doing that. And what they do is um, try to <coughs> aim a scholastic framework to do this. So in the background of what they're saying publicly, they've also been busy creating things that look like this. So not an academic journal, so the, 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 sorry, it's not an academic journal, but, you know, um, but it looks like it could be. Um, also the Institute of Historical Review, which of course looks very similar to the Institute of Historical Research. Um, and also, kind of these books here, so Did Something Mean When You Die, was um, authored by a man called Richard E. Harwood, which was a pseudonym for Richard Bill, who was in the National Front in Britain. But they claimed that Richard Harwood, who did exist, had an um, eminent post at London University. So they were kind of putting out this kind of idea that there's an academic um, background to this. So when people, when they get the attention of people, they'll say, hey, go and look at the literature. And those people that are dedicated will go and look at it like, wow, it looks like a journal. Oh, look, this book's got footnotes. It must be legitimate and real. Um, so kind of some of the key points I just kind of want to talk about. How long have I got? Two minutes, okay. So I'll quickly get through this. Um, so it's an analysis of the language within it is very masculine, because they people who don't politics. Um, and they also kind of point into this kind of political narrative that you know, it's also about protecting women. It's also a very you know, strange narrative to that. Um, so they use simple slogans to hook on people. So no holes, no holocaust, and then they can direct people to see the academic structure that they've got in place behind it. Um, they use um, oh, um, so they don't like to present themselves as victims in this white genocide narrative that they're putting out there. But also anything that deviates from that is labelled as part of the Jewish conspiracy. So we have the label of uh, liberal democracy, identity politics, international finance, cultural Marxism, all of those things will be levelled at anyone who tries to break out from that particular idea. Um, and it's a shift from this kind of old um, racism, which might be much talk about supremacy, to a kind of cultural racism, a new racism, which is it's kind of not about uh, saying people are inferior or superior, that they're just different and the culture needs to be protected. Um, and then kind of other, but what's interesting about denial as well, other extreme groups will distance themselves from denial with the same 
um, racist message and say, look, we're not like these people because we don't have political denial. So also the absence of political denial in the movement, as far as it can be really interesting, the fact that they're trying to separate that out. So finally, what do we do about it? Because it's the kind of thing that we were here. So fixing the uh, leaky pipelines um, can be in the back of ideas that I'm kind of calling this. So one of the main things I think problems with this is the academy itself. Like we have this big problem of matrix culture in which we're trying to be, you know, do something to the ref or careful or careful, whatever it is. But none of those things actually give us the time to actively be, you know, political activists in these spaces. We say we want to be political activists and get into there. But, you know, when we get home, we're knackered and we're tired because we're kind of fighting to get, you know, things referable or whatever. We kind of, kind of, kind of go, oh, you know, can I, can I, you know, do I have the energy for this as well? So we need to think about the institution itself. Um, we kind of need to understand the kind of uh, use of the Holocaust in British education. I think one of the key things about uh, the Holocaust as well is it also ties in with some of the things that means that, um, particularly in the national curriculum, is that we don't talk about kind of um, um, the crimes of what um, you know, white British people have done in the past. And this kind of ties back to what kind of Greg was saying right at the beginning, I think it's really interesting. People want to have those narratives of, we did this, aren't we great? Um, you know, look at this past, and use those answers. But it's fine if you want to do that, but if you want to take that thing, you also have to take this with you as well, which is this kind of history of empire that's not particularly nice. You know, you can't just kind of cherry pick the bits and we have to be there at the forefront and say, if you're taking that, fine, but you have this as well to deal with. Um, uh, I mean, this is what kind of more of a question. I think you should touch on it. I'm not really convinced of it, but think we can, uh, can we fight fire with fire? Do we need to have more populist narratives? Do we need to have more of a kind of way of combating these more easily and quickly, rather than the kind of 30 thread Twitter response to something that people won't read, and they'll just kind of go and ignore that and go back to the simple messages. Um, and, um, you know, can, and can, um, you know, we should be talking more about this kind of idea of white fragility. I think that um, it's been put by uh, Robin D'Angelo, which is that part of the problem sometimes is that um, when people call us culture Marxists, or when people say, the lunatic left fringe out. What they're saying is, you're breaking white solidarity. You're stepping out and questioning, you know, this whiteness that we kind of hold together and don't look at in enough detail. So I think that's part of the thing we're doing. Um, and I think you know, you might have seen that the other day. You have a hashtag, sorry for breaking white solidarity, when you put out the truth there. You know, <coughs> this is what we've done. We've done. You know, we're trying to do these things. Um, and finally, just um, you know, recognising the limits of our own knowledge. I mean, we want to engage in these particular spheres, but it's all about the process of learning as well. And um, that, you know, we all have our own kind of biases that we need to be aware of and think about those things and think those things through. And again, this kind of, kind of comes back to the problem at the beginning of the institution itself, because when you have time to actually thoroughly research, read new material, read books on things like about white solidarity or, you know, kind of more, more generalised kind of things that we could help us in the fight to understand it when we're so busy trying to kind of master our own fields and then engage with the public. So I think there's something about that that needs to be thought about if we want to be properly activists about how we reorganise or find some of the ways that the academy is organised. Uh, yeah.